Hi everyone, Dr. Palmer here. So today we're going to talk about the intersections of beauty, gender, and race, and kind of how it relates to um, culture and how it has arised, Western culture specifically, and um, how it um, affects our current view of what is beauty. The vocabulary is presented here in alphabetical order, not as it appears throughout the lecture. Um, so please just make note of that. And when you are going through and if you're taking notes, um, just know that this is not the order and it might be a little bit jumbled up. So when we discuss notions of Western beauty. Partha Mitter in 2000 wrote the article in the examination of beauty and the hot and taut Venus. Mitter discusses the notions of Western beauty and the far-reaching notions related to the idea of beauty to the Roman Greco cultures. The Western ideal of art history draws from Roman Greco traditions of art and sculpture. David by Michelangelo in the 16th century Renaissance period mimics the style of Polycletus, which idealized the male athletic form. This is featured in the image on the left upper corner as I am highlighting it. And we can see through the proportions the sculptedness of the male figure of the musculature that became the consensus for what an ideal human figure is. And because during this Roman Greco period, males were public and females were private, we had gymnasiums where men would um, exercise in the nude. We had the Olympics where men would um, compete in the nude. Um, that meant um, these sculptures were idealizing this human form. And in the Renaissance, when they're looking back to kind of reformulate and bolster uh, European culture um, to what they thought was the highest um, culture because they were coming out of the Black Death um, and the plague, um, they looked back to these Roman Greco sculptures um, to, you know, kind of reinstill that pride um, and the, um, the creativity of the time, not only in art, but also in thought. Um, so Mitter also notes that Plato's argument that art could not ever match the true nature of beauty actually promoted an anti-art philosophy that um, spurred artists to do composites, take the best of human beings, and create art that would reflect these ideal notions of beauty. And we can see in this um, right below Polycletus's um, image, the lower left-hand corner, we can see that um, this is a sculpture of Aphrodite, which was actually a composite of about five or six different um, women that were considered beautiful at the time. Um, and then even though, um, like let's say they, people were aware of um, different traditions, um, for instance, the traditions of the Indus River Valley, which is very ancient, um, coming up around the same time um, as um, the Roman Greco notions. You know, we had Alexander the Great that traveled to um, the Indus River Valley and actually took on a um, Indian wife. Um, so there was a lot of cultural um, contact um, in this old world. Um, those notions of beauty, um, when they were brought back, they were just seen as um, symbolic. They weren't really thought of to be 
things that were embodied in the flesh. So they were considered to be um, fertility symbols. And if we look down at the bottom right picture, um, where we see a couple, um, a male and female couple that are um, in an embrace, the female has very um, like enlarged breasts. She has uh, voluptuous hips. The man is less sculpted than the Roman Greco figure. Um, it's more of a soft abdomen, um, more kind of graceful curves. That was just considered um, symbolic and notions about fertility rather than being um, something that the uh, citizens of that um, culture would uh, try to idealize and reproduce in their actual human forms. So in our example of beauty from around the world, if we take a look and we um, juxtapose it with notions of Western beauty, we here might think it's very strange and different. And that was the case when um, people began traveling um, in the Renaissance period and encountering people that looked um, superbly different from um, how people used to encounter people, which was, you know, slowly and gradually. So in the first example, if we look at West Africa toward the Wadabi people, we see that their men are elaborately decorated with um, not only makeup, but accessories. And this is so that they could display their, um, not only their wealth, but their beauty and their ability, their skill to use um, what they had at hand to make themselves more beautiful and attractive to women. So in our Western society, we have come to a place where um, women are the ones that adorn themselves and that um, mimic um, the beauty and elaboration of maybe the natural world um, and enhance certain traits that are attractive for reproducing, such as lipstick um, and um, blush to make the, the cheeks look, um, you know, flushed. And so you have a healthy um, appearance to the opposite sex. Um, the lipstick is supposed to mimic um, the flushedness of the vaginal lips um, when people are aroused. Um, and actually the um, material of the uh, lips and the nose are actually the same material that is made of the genitals. So it's the same kind of tissue. Um, so it gets aroused in the same way. Um, anyway, back to these global um, these global notions of beauty. So you have these men, um, these Wadabi men who are very elaborate and they're competing with each other to gain a mate, right? A, a female mate, because we're, we're talking about right now heterosexual um, notions of beauty. Um, and when we look at um, the Papua New Guinean people, um, so there's a, an example here of a man who, who has the yellow on his face in the lower right corner of the screen. Um, and if we were to see more of him, he would have uh, feathers um, and he would have, you know, paint all over his body um, and a, a lot of adornments as well. And this is not necessarily to, um, to attract a mate per se, because in Papua New Guinea um, culture, um, the, it is very gender segregated, at least traditionally prior to European occupation and colonization. Um, there, it was a very uh, gender segregated culture where men lived in one house, um, you know, a big communal house and women lived in another house. And the only time men and women really came together was to copulate. So in this case, um, with the, the Papua New Guinea um, example, men were actually trying to um, mimic the beauty of nature. And so the colors of um, the, the birds that they saw um, was mimicked in their um, facial makeup and their body makeup. The um, adornments of feathers and um, shells, that was all um, to be taken like as composites, kind of like uh, talked about Aphrodite was a composite of um, different women and then put placed into sculpture. Well, um, Papua New Guinea men 
um, were adorning themselves to, um, you know, kind of speak to the beauty of nature. And they were taking all the best parts of nature and, you know, adorning themselves and making themselves look beautiful. Um, and there was a lot of actually homoerotic um, and homosexual activity that were going on between um, these uh, male people in um, the men's houses. And actually, um, in order to reproduce, it was believed that men um, or young men had to uh, perform fellatio on older men. So they had to consume the semen um, in order to make them um, fertile so that, that when they did join with the um, women, you know, the people of the opposite sex, and they did have sex, they did copulate um, that uh, fluid, that seminal fluid would allow them to um, impregnate the women, and then the women would go back to their women's houses, and, um, you know, they would have their children. Um, and then at a certain age, um, the male, um, male offspring, at about like 10, um, they would then be transferred to the um, male house. And that's how that worked. So um, very, very different, not only gender norms, but um, um, yeah, beauty norms as well. And then um, looking at the upper right corner of the screen, you see the sculpture, um, a mask of um, a queen mother. Um, and is carved out of ivory. And when I actually studied art history, um, this was just supposed to be an example of um, like an ideal. When actual, in actuality, this uh, represented a specific human being, which was the mother of Eseji, who was the, like I said, the queen mother of the king at that time, king um, of, uh, the Benin Kingdom, right? Um, and so this also typified, um, you know, a kind of idealized beauty, but it was also a specific person um, that was being represented. And this mask is from the um, 1600s. And then finally, moving to the lower left image, we have a sculpture from around 618 to 907 AD from the Tang Dynasty in China. This um, typifies the notions of beauty during this time, which was um, kind of large women, um, so full-bodied um, and uh, minute feet, um, minute hands, um, and very just kind of soft figures. Uh, if you liken it to something within the Western um, period of art um, and culture, we would look to the Baroque period um, within um, Western culture where women were robust. Um, they were soft. And this was to show not only the wealth of the, um, the people um, that were being depicted, but also the, um, the health of them. So the more um, robust you were, the more wealth, you know, access to wealth you had because you could consume more. Um, the less musculature you would have um, meant that you uh, didn't do manual labor. You could, you know, do a life, a life of um, leisure. Um, that also spoke to the paleness of skin. So um, not only in Europe was pale skin for a long time, considered a marker of beauty because it meant that you could be maintained inside and you didn't do outside work. Um, in Asia, and to a certain extent, those, um, those values continue in Asia today, you have um, this uh, light skin um, signifying that you had the leisure time to just kind of hang out in the shade, either um, under an umbrella or within um, the confines of a home, of a house, um, and that actually showed that, you know, that was considered beautiful because it was only peasants that were, you know, kind of um, had that tan skin. Um, very, very different from how we see beauty today. Um, I was actually quite struck when I went to 
uh, Indiana when I moved from New York City to Indiana and saw all the tanning um, establishments and I was like what is going on and it, you know it's because um, tanning is a marker in our contemporary society of a person that has the ability to um, lay out in the sun to work on a specific complexion so very much contrasted from how um, you know we, we saw things um, a long time ago and this is not to say that you know tan skin is a universal throughout the world right because we're dealing with um, many many cultures um, and seven billion people so the standards um, that we hold in our contemporary society might not necessarily hold within the standards of you know a culture um, you know halfway across the world so let's look at some other examples of beauty. So um, with men's bodies, there's also ideals, right? Um, and we saw that with the Roman Greco examples um, within the sculpture that um, Renaissance and also, um, you know, some Western cultures of today look towards. But this is just a um, one kind of composite of a, of a man, a, like a kind of generalized men man's body um, and it's uh, altered depending on which nation that they are looking at so the first one and the, the words are cut off a little bit um, but the first one is the Egyptian ideal so we see a little bit more sculpted body um, like a slimmer waist the second image so I'm going from the left to the right um, the second image is um, like the ideal body of a Nigerian man so we see like a little bit softer, um, less musculature. Um, and, you know, of course, if we're talking about um, skin complexion as well, um, that person would probably be very much darker. Um, but for some reason in this composite, they're just kind of bringing a, a general, um, like, flesh colored, if you will, um, which has been thrown out, I believe, of the Crayola crayon. So now what used to be flesh colored uh, when I was growing up in the early 1980s is now like called peach, which is probably more appropriate because flesh is a whole bunch of different colors, right? Um, and then looking to the third example, we have the Russian, um, the Russian body, and you'll see like a slimmer waistline. Um, less, you know, kind of cut in the abdominals, um, but like more uh, full chest. Moving to, I'm not actually sure what this one is, um, but we see this fourth image is much more kind of rounded um, abdomen, like even a little bit more rounded than the Nigerian perspective, but very broad um, in the in the shoulders. And moving to the fifth example. Um, which I believe is South Africa. You have um, like a more flatter chest, um, like higher, um, higher, what are they called? Pectoral muscles, but a little bit flatter than like the Egyptian example to the far left, um, slimmer waistline, and again, very, um, very chiseled abdominals. Um, and then United Kingdom and Venezuela, two other different body types. So this is kind of more a contemporary example, but um, a very, you know, like it just kind of shows an example of like how varied um, national beauty standards can be. We kind of continued. Um, beauty competition so an example of you know kind of two extremes and um I, I might discuss this a little bit now i might discuss it later as well but um so what is beauty right we have all these beauty competitions um and we have uh because we are um a lot of our nations now are multi-racial, multicultural, multi-ethnic right so we have these different um varying levels of um, competitions where we are trying to seek an ideal, right? So with um, like bodybuilding competitions, we see a whole bunch of different ranges of probably ethnicities and races, right? Um, but we tend to see a specific musculature that people are looking for. So, um, and that is considered beautiful, right? Um, people are judged, or uh, these women and men when they compete, um, they're judged on, you know, 
uh, depending if you know like if it's natural body competitions or fitness competitions because there's all different sorts of levels you have different levels of musculature that are allowed um, so within this competition um, it's probably like miss uh, um, miss olympia because that's the highest um, they do not test for um, steroids. Um, and so the musculature is gonna be very, very developed, very uh, much on par with male bodybuilding. They'll have striations within their muscles and their muscles are gonna be very, very developed, right? Um, and so that is a version of beauty, right? To some people. Um, and it's a, a fetishized um, version of a, a it's a fetishize of, of muscles, right? Um, and then we move on to the kind of other extreme or what what is like more accepted within our general ideas of what we as um, contemporary people think of a beautiful woman, right? And so this is a an example of um, um, competitors in uh, the Miss Universe contest where you have women competing from all over the world coming together um, and they were chosen from their countries um, to represent their nation, right? So you have Miss Ghana, um, Miss Thailand, South Africa, and Sri Lanka. So although they are very different in like their skin tones, um, if you look at their body proportions, um, they are very similar. And if you look at their facial features, they're, they're also quite similar to each other. They have um, kind of large eyes, um, kind of aquiline noses. Um, they all have some sort of long hair. Um, they, they are slim in their bodies. Not one of these women look at all like the um, bodybuilder women. They probably, if there was somebody who like had um, musculature of, of that, um, sort and they were competing to um, to be you know represent their country they probably wouldn't make it very far because of the standards of beauty and the ideal and the um, the image and the women to the right are going to be seen within um, the beauty standards of a lot of our advertisements right and a lot of our um, our movies we're not going to necessarily see um, women that look like the bodybuilders as, um, you know, like as being Wonder Woman, right? Even though they like, they're super strong looking and they probably would be more suitable um, to be like playing Wonder Woman than um, any of the women to the right. But our standards of beauty um, are soft they're flowy, right? They're what we would call um, and typify as graceful. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit more about this um, later on in the presentation.
So talking more about art, um, the male gaze. So this is really important within um, art history, Western art history. Um, and even today when we're talking about kind of decolonizing or um, you know, kind of fighting the patriarchy, if you've heard those, those terms um, within um, our recent uh, Me Too movements um, and Black Lives Matters movements um, and just decolonization process in general. So um, the male gaze, uh, basically when we look at the history of Western cultures that are founded on Christian patriarchy and we take inspiration from um, the Roman Greco uh, societies, men were public, women were private, right? And in the creative industries, this was also mimicked. So um, men dominated the creative industries of painters and sculptors, right? Um, and therefore, um, the things that were depicted are the things that men liked to view, right? So within painting, we had a lot of um, like, um, women that were depicted in Renaissance times, uh, moving away from religion. Um, they actually, when they were looking at um, images to produce um, for biblical images, um, when women were depicted, the, um, the artists actually had to use uh, female prostitutes to you know disrobe or just to pose for them because women of any moral for moral virtues um, would not sit in the presence of a of a strange man right um, and so because again women were private men were public and the only women that would um, sit for these portraits were um, prostitutes and the artist um, Caravaggio, an Italian Renaissance artist, who did a lot of religious paintings. Um, this is one that I'll just kind of highlight down at the bottom here. Um, shows um, the Virgin Mary and a, um, an angel that are both uh, depicted um, using female prostitutes. Um, and then uh, Michelangelo's The Last Judgment in the Vatican um, shows a lot of naked figures. Um, and um, these were actually um, prostitutes, uh, depictions of prostitutes that were probably seen when Michelangelo was going to the bathhouses. Um, and so these are probably kind of very uh, realistic um, scenes that uh, he saw on his visits to the um, the broth, uh, not only brothels but um, bathhouses, and um, these bathhouses and brothels actually had both male and female prostitutes. Um, and if we take into consideration sexuality, um, a lot of these. Um, artists uh, had varying degrees of um, sexual pro proclivities that were not necessarily based on the ideal heterosexual um, norms of the time, right? So you had um, promiscuous promiscuity, and you also had um, varying degrees of heterosexual or homosexual or you know bisexual pansexualism, right? Um, because the notions of sexuality that we have today um, are, are norms of heterosexuality, um, which are fairly recent within the 1800s. Um, they're very different from the norms of the Renaissance period. And then looking at um, some uh, paintings, uh, kind of Renaissance period as well, um, or sorry, uh, moving on from the Renaissance to the Enlightenment period, we have um, in the bottom, um, sorry, top top left corner, we have Gerard von Horst um, is looking at, um, we have that male gaze really firmly focused um, on the breasts, the bare breasts of 
well, not completely bare, but the bare chest of a, a woman, and she was a prostitute. Um, and the um, title of the image is called the Procurus. It was painted in oil um, in 1625. And um, it's the male um, images that are in the, the painting are darkened, they're just silhouettes whereas our gaze is firmly focused with that light um, on the chest and the face of the woman because that is what the male gaze desired, right? And then moving on um, to La Toilette by uh, Henri um, de la Trousse Lautrec. Um, this is also a, an image of a, um, a prostitute and um, we see that very paleness that we discussed earlier um, that depicted, you know, like wealth. Um, we see those very soft um, forms of the female body. Um, and we see her in a very reclined pose and very much, um, instead of with all these other images, the, the gaze is far away. We have a gaze that is kind of challenging um, and more kind of in your face. So it's actually, yes, it is showing the beauty of the female figure, but it's also challenging that gaze by um, staring directly into the, the audience's eyes, right? And we do also see within this image a, um, a, a juxtaposition between um, what is kind of beautiful, and should be public and what is kind of hidden, right? So, um, and, and you know, it's dealing with race as well because we see this um, Euro, um, European uh, woman um, who is light skinned, very, very pale, um, and she's completely disrobed. And it is um, juxtaposed with a dark skin figure, um, most likely of African descent, who is fully uh, covered, right? Um, because we want to hide things that we don't see um, as beautiful, and we want to kind of put on display those things that we think are beautiful, right? And so we also see this idea of gender being um, kind of challenged as well. So if we think back to the Roman Greco period where men were the point of focus and they were the things that were public and beautiful, now we see women being the point of focus and those are the things that are considered beautiful. And then if we look um, at the contrast between the, um, the kind of how um, things were rendered, right? We have hyper-realism within the Renaissance periods and then within these uh, kind of more impressionist uh, movements, we have um, things that are being a little bit distorted. Um, we have the art uh, showing brush marks and we have um, that hyper-realism isn't as important as the message behind it. Let's talk about these ideas of symmetry. So when we look at Roman Greco um, period, there's this idea of symmetry. Um, and Mitter talks about um, these ideas of symmetry and how it, um, when we look at the human body, when we look at human faces, um, what is seen as healthy is symmetry. Now, um, that is an ideal. And when we kind of look at first glances with people, um, they look symmetrical, right? Uh, most people have two hands, they have two eyes, two nostrils, two lips, two sides of the face that are fairly symmetri symmetrical, right? Um, people have two legs, and then so these are notions of um, what is depicting health, right? This is what Mitter argues, this is what popular psychology also has um, discussed. Um, there is this zoologist named Desmond Morris who also looks at these ideas of symmetry and how um, there are, he examines studies of um, psychology using infants, human infants, and how they are um, shown images and um, of human faces and um, they kind of look at the child's reaction and when they see the more symmetrical a face the person sees or the baby sees, the, um, the better the um, 
like the kind of coos and the more favorable the, the body language is, is of the um, infant. And the less symmetrical the face is, um, the more kind of the, the infant kind of retracts. And so these, sim these ideas of symmetry are not only artistic based, but they're um, also, they have um, basis in psychology, at least um, to promote a certain ideal, right? But when we really look at symmetry and we are able to, through our technology now, when we cut people's faces in half, which is what um, the artist um, did in the upper left <laughs> images, I'm sorry, the upper left images, we see that um, when you cut a person's face off, so, and you just kind of reproduce the left side, um, and mirror it, we get very different images from how they would appear as a, from when you cut off the and block off the left side and you reproduce the right side, you'll see you know very different depictions of what a person looks like. Um, they might look like uh, the brother or sister of you know like a, a sibling rather of that same person. And taking a person like Marilyn Monroe is a pretty famous figure, um, actress from the 50s and 60s. Um, the image of her, you know, how she appeared in everyday life is in the center. And then when we um, take the left half of her face and mirror it, rep um, reproduce it, we see, um, yeah, she looks like Marilyn Monroe, but there is definitely um, a difference in how she looks, right? And when we do the same thing, mirror the other side of her face, yeah, she looks like Marilyn Monroe, but um, a little bit, you know, different, like maybe a, a bigger sister, whereas the one on the other side looks like a, a, a slimmer sister, right? But um, at one point, Marilyn Monroe was considered like the most beautiful woman, um, at least in the American world, right? Um, she was highly, uh, highly sought after actress and, um, uh, even up until like even today people still try to recreate her look right because of what was seen as so beautiful with within her um her face like her skin color the proportions of of her um of her body and her face however uh she was not in complete proportion and some would argue that it is the imperfections that actually make us uh beautiful right um, and then just looking at the internal organs of the human body, um, these ideas of symmetry, they are ideals, right? They're not necessarily what, um, what is in uh, general population because, um, yeah, we have two hands, we have two ears, two eyes, um, ideally, right? But when we look at the human um, internal organs, we are not proportionate at all. We are, I mean, it, we're not symmetrical at all, right? We have two lungs, but one lung is bigger than the other, right? We have a stomach, but we only have one stomach, and then we have like a spleen, and we have like pancreas, and they're just kind of all jumbled up, but they don't necessarily um, they fit, but they're not like exactly mimicking each other, right? There's no organ that looks just like the stomach that is going to, you know, be that, have that symmetry, right? You have the intestines where on the um, right side, you have the ascending colon, then you have this transverse colon, and then the descending colon on the left, and you have all this mishmash in the center, right? Um, where our food travels, and it's not symmetrical. So this idea of symmetry being healthy, yeah, it's all good and well and, and interesting, but it's not necessarily um, like, it, it's very superficial, right? Um, and if we go a little bit deeper, mm, might not necessarily mean all that much. Okay, right. So we focused on uh, the male gaze. And so when we look at the male gaze within the creative industries, um, it was mostly men that were doing the paintings. Yes, there were anomalies with women that were um, doing Renaissance paintings and other paintings and were um, professional artists, but they're kind of few and far between. And those are the ones that don't necessarily get the, um, the stories told about them, right? Um, and their names do not have the recognition that the, um, the names of male creative um, their, their male cre creative counterparts, right? 
And so now when we're looking at European colonization, um, it's really important to look at the gender dynamic within that um, period of history as well. So when you have the Renaissance and like moving into the 1500s, um, you had Columbus 1492, he sailed the ocean blue, we know that. Um, we have Pizarro, we have Jan van Riebeck, who is um, featured in the coin down at the bottom left corner of the screen. Um, you also have Thomas Jefferson and George Washington who are exploring new worlds, right? Creating America, the United States. Um, all of these were men, right? There are no women, very few women. Um, up until the early 1600s, there were no European women that were coming over, right? Um, and so you had conquistadors, right? Going into um, South America, that's what we call them. Um, in uh, English, we call them soldiers, right? Mercenaries. You have businessmen, people looking to establish um, and, and take hold of trade, right? That was Columbus. We had sailors, um, and then we had priests and missionaries, again, all men. And then we also had convicts, right? Um, so again, up until the 1600s, most of these people were men. Um, now, Yes, the Renaissance gave us the technology uh, within ships and sextants and com compasses that enabled people to move um, more into the open seas. But those guys were traveling long periods of time, weeks and weeks and weeks, um, by themselves. And uh, human beings are sexual animals, right? And so, yes, there might have been some homosexual, hemorrhotic activity going on on the ships. Um, and even when they landed in their new places, that they would uh, come to colonize. Uh, there might have been some homo homoerotic things going on. But then um, human beings also have this um, need to reproduce. And um, there's also like, um, you know, men that were heterosexual, right? And so when they encountered, um, you know, uh, native women, um, some of them got aroused. And so there were couplings that happened between European men and um, indigenous women. So we'll talk a little bit more about that in the next slide. So looking at the Cape Colony in um, Cape of Good Hope in South Africa. So um, in the first 80 years of the colony with European women in short supply, because again, women did not necessarily come over to um, the colonies. Um, many colonial men married free slaves and indigenous women. So um, the first people that Jan van Riebeck encountered in the 1600s were the Khoisan people, right? And these are the descendants of the woman known as Hottentot Venus. These were her, sorry, not descendants, these were the ancestors, right? Um, so um, kind of mid 1600s, these um, indigenous people of the southern um, most part of Africa, they were encountered um, and they were mostly herder people. And um, they actually uh, came and they were kind of friendly to the Dutch people and they provided them, um, some say, they provided them with cattle and you know taught them things um, until the, the, the visitors, the European visitors, um, got to, you know, they, they weren't the best visitors and they just started um, thinking that they could bully the indigenous people around. And so it created a conflict. Um, and then you have, like I said, some men that wanted to be with women um, and, you know, the women didn't necessarily want to be with them. And so there were instances of rape going on. Um, and so, uh, yeah, you had these violent encounters um, that continued for a, a couple of um, few hundred years. Um, but yeah, the because there were no European women um, during the, these first um, 80 years of European colonization, um, you had um, European men marrying um, Khoisan women um, and uh, freed slaves. So the female to male ratio at the time 
was two to one in the um, new colon colonized cities and three to one in rural areas. So the women far outnumbered men and it created a gender balance or imbalance that led to uh, racial mixing. So sexual relations between Dutchmen and Christianized Hottentot and Khoi women, because these are kind of um, two separate groups of indigenous people. Um, so the, the intermingling of these two people were very common. However, um, with the establishment of permanent Dutch colonies in the Cape, um, and a smallpox epidemic, uh, which devastated the indigenous people in 1713. The Khoi, um, ha who had been the major source of domestic labor for the Dutch, their decline meant that they needed to um, import um, other domestic servants and slaves from Madagascar, Mozambique, and also the Dutch colonies in um, the East Indies, namely, um, India and Indonesia. So what this did was create a, another source of women that actually um, appealed more to the European aesthetics, the European male aesthetics that they were used to. Um, so longer, more um, flowy hair than the indigenous um, uh, Khoi women that had um, a hair that was close cut and very close to the head. And that was because of, you know, the, um, the evolution and an adaptation of um, human beings, right? Um, and so um, the European men, the, the, the colony, um, the colonizer men, um, men of European descent ended up favoring these um, Indonesian um, and Indian women to be their um, partners um, because they were used to and more accustomed to that aesthetic. And this is just an image of, um, on the right hand side, an image of, a, um, of a, an Indonesian uh, woman from the time. So, um, according to Pierre L. van de Berg, um, approximately three quarters of all children born um, in the Cape Colony um, were from female slaves of varying either Khoisan, Hottentot, or um, Indonesian, Mozambican, or Madagascar uh, women, and then the 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 fathers were, the, or the progenitors were of European descent, interestingly enough. So it created this um, hierarchy of women. So when we come to, um, uh, you know, moving on in the 1800s, when you, in late 1700s, when you get more European women coming over, um, and it became more acceptable for Europeans to travel, um, to these far-flung places, um, it in South Africa specifically, um, it became a marker of wealth and status to actually gain a European wife, because to gain a European wife meant that you um, had the capability to hold her up to the um, living standard that she um, was used to, right? Um, and also, um, at least in South Africa, those European women that were coming over to the colony, they were of um, certain classes of women, right? And certain classes of family. Therefore, um, the ideal woman was a European woman. Um, and it also appealed to their aesthetics and it became this hierarchy where European were, women were the um, most sought after. Um, they were the ones that uh, were being married. And then uh, maybe women of mixed race, they would be of like a lesser quality. You could still marry them. But then indigenous women, um, they were just used as concubines and prostitutes, you know, just a way to um, kind of get your thrill off. 
And so let's talk a little bit about this idea of hybridization and miscegenation. And um, I'll focus on hybrids right now. So the definition of the hybrid is an animal or plant whose parents differ in some hereditary characteristic or belong to different groups as breeds or species. Um, and then the second definition is something that is of mixed origin or composition. Um, the car is a hybrid that runs on gas or electricity. That's a really super contemporary and modern example. Um, hybrid is the adjective and, uh, and also noun, but hybridization is the noun, which is the process of creating a hybrid. So when we talk about these ideas of um, people kind of traveling all across the world and these ideas of um, difference in beauty, um, we can look at um, to the Spanish examples, uh, Spanish colonies and Portuguese colonies, um, which actually categorized people depending on what um, race mixes that they were, right? So um, in the upper right um, image, you have um, this, these paintings and they were postcards, um, or turned into postcards that were um, readily available and uh, traded and they depicted um, the different racial groupings. Um, I believe, and I'm just gonna look to my other screen real quick, um, the combination of a, um, of a mulata, which is a mulata is the combination of a, um, a white man and a black uh, woman, so European man and an African woman coming together, they created a mulata, um, which basically um, harkens back to the word of mule. A mule is a combination between a horse and a donkey, and it is supposed to have the strength of um, the strength of a donkey, but the temperament of a horse, um, and so. The people that were making these um, these casta, right? That's what they were called. These images that were showing like what two groups of a of a race would create, like their offspring. Um, the mulata it actually harkens back to this kind of dehumanization um, through which you are naming a specific type of human mixture after an animal. So anyway, um, the combination of, I believe it's a mulata and a, it might be an indio, or I'm not sure. The, the writing is very small, but you can find these um, all over the place. Um, that offspring would be called a lobo. Lobo is um, a wolf, right? And so by naming these hybrids, right, these mixing of two different types of people, they're actually dehumanizing them, right, um, instead of them just calling human beings. In uh, North America, in, you know, the United States, um, they named people uh, according to a degree of blood. So you still had mulatto, um, which meant a European person um, mixing with an African person, creating this kind of half breed, right? Um, and then um, with regard to African blood, when you have a mulatto mixing with a, um, uh, another European person and creating the offspring, then you would have quadroon. And then from there, if you have that quadroon, because it's like a quarter um, African blood, um, from there, um, the quadroon mixing with a European, another you know person of full European descent, they would uh, create an octoroon. And I believe that's as far as the categorization went. But um, when we think about the uh, law of hypodescent, um, where you have one drop of blood um, designated in a person's body, creating them to be um, you know African or black, um, which uh, dehumanizes them, right? Because that, that is an old way of looking at and disenfranchising people. Because the more, um, if you have a drop of black blood in you, that means you cannot 
um, run for office, you are immediately enslaved, uh, you are limited on who you could marry, right? Um, and so um, this idea of hybridization within the human population is very dehumanizing, right? And we can see this throughout uh, not only the naming, but these idea, um, these representations of custom. Moving right along to this idea of miscegenation. So um, there was a lot of um, anti-miscegenation laws. Um, so they did not want people of um, European and African descent to mix because, and, and this also went for European and uh, Native American, right? because this was seen to, hybrids were not pure, right? And if we're looking at pedigree, um, you know, people uh, being of certain um, class of people, but also certain families, you want to keep that pedigree nice and clean. You want to mix um, and intermarry with uh, people of high class. Um, and so this is where you come into these ideas of eugenics, right? And so you have a lot of propaganda around uh, trying to prevent these um, mixed offspring to be created because um, whereas in certain animals like a, a mule right um, you take the best of both worlds and bring or best of both animals and bring forth a, a better animal however mules are typically um, they cannot reproduce they're infertile so this idea was to be um, the same thing within um, the human population. So um, there would be the degradation of the human um, animal, if you will, um, through interracial mixing. So there was a lot of anti-miscegenation uh, laws that were actually only um, uh, kind of, uh, they were only outlawed in the 1960s. And so an example of um, a challenge to this law that actually, you know, kind of broke the law, anti-miscegenation laws, was um, the case um, of this couple down here on the bottom right hand corner, um, the Love versus Virginia case, because um, um, the man of European descent, um, Mr. Love, he wanted to marry um, his sweetheart, who was uh, both of uh, Native American and Afro-American descent. Um, they wanted to get married. They actually had, I think, four children. Um, they went out of their county to get married. Um, and then when they came, because uh, within their county, um, miscegenation, they, it was illegal. And so when they went back to their county, they kind of lived in hiding for a little bit. And then they were... Um, they were uh, they were found out. Um, they went on trial. They moved out of their um, hometown for a while, but because like all of their families lived in the area, they went back and they they took their case all the way up to the Supreme Court um, to um, fight these um, these laws that were basically just racist laws. Um, hearkening back to uh, eugenics movements. And so after that, um, you have um, miscegenation laws are dismantled throughout the country, right? There were certain places where um, it didn't matter, like up north, where you could get married, um, you know, of a, to a person of a different race. It wasn't necessarily looked happily upon by society, but um, it wasn't illegal. So, um, aptly named um, this case, you know, Love versus um, the state of Virginia, um, you know, dismantled these rules so that um, anyone could get married, regardless of, uh, you know, like their uh, national, uh, racial, or religious views. Um, and then just some, you know, like um, uh, propaganda that, you know, wanted to, harken, you know, bring back these anti-miscegenation laws. You have this, um, you know, civil rights movement with busing, um, bringing in um, African American students into you know Euro Euro American um, schools. Um, you have propaganda that says you know this is from communists um, and it's going to create like race mixing and you know 
so hearkening on the fear of the other, right? Um, because the Negro at the time was the other, um, and the Euro-American was the norm, right? And um, by having just people be able to um, learn in the same places and maybe create friendships, you would have cases where they would intermarry and create um, offspring that were not necessarily uh, pure and um, as physically or mentally viable, because that's what you um, people that think about eugenics, that's what people um, believe is that, you know, when you mix races, when you mix classes, it actually degrades the, um, the offspring. So interestingly enough, we have um, like in the late 1900s, um, so miscegenation has like anti-miscegenation laws have been erased and you have a lot more um, miscegenation race mixing going on with regard to intermarriages and um, interracial marriages and offspring produced. Um, so um, I remember actually, <laughs> because I am of mixed race, um, my mother was friends with this, um, well, who she's now married to, um, this zoologist um, and neuroscientist um, who, and this was, I feel like it was in 1983 that um, we went to dinner and he was, uh, he might have, there was an article, um, I'm not sure if it was in the New York, uh, New, New Yorker magazine or Times magazine or wherever, but I remember him saying, um, predicting that, oh, in like 40 years time, everyone is going to look like you. And he was referring to me, right? Because um, I sort of have ambiguous kind of racial features. Um, and so he was, you know, referring to this trend of um, race mixing that was going on. Um, and also referring to, I suppose, my mother <laughs> and uh, my father and having produced me as, as offspring. Um, and then, so in the Mitter article, um, Pratha Mitter um, from 2000, they mention how um, in 1994, Times um, Magazine did this uh, article where, um, and it was the front cover, how they took composites, again, just like the Aphrodite composites, um, of the most beautiful women to create this um, ideal of the goddess of love. Um, we have this uh, composite sketch, if you will, but computer sketch of all these different um, races and uh, genders come together to create ah, the future of America, right? Um, and so here is the, um, the Times Magazine um, cover. And, it, you know, she kind of has like, kind of medium tone, you know, skin tone, um, very symmetrical features. And again, this is promoting an ideal of what the future would look like in America. If we look around, it really depends on the community that you live in, right? Because we have all different types of, of people. But um, this is what was, you know, like, it, it's kind of propaganda, right? Um, to show that it's going to be okay. We're still, human beings are still going to be beautiful, right? Regardless of whatever mixes that, that occur, right? Um, and then this article from uh, 2014, um, 2013, 2014, um, shows a composite of um, like the future of what, again, um, human beings will look like, you know, the, the race. Um, and again, we have, you know, very symmetrical um, and features that um, look like they would be reproducible, right? That people would want to reproduce. So like light eyes, big lips, kind of aquiline nose. So these ideals um, of what human beauty um, and human beings will look like. And then we can look at the, um, the trend of um, racial mixing um, by looking at the Pew Research charts right here at the bottom, um, the trend has gone up, 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 right? Um, because with more movement of people, with more, um, um, you know, people encountering and appreciating um, different looks um, and just like the more acceptance that we have 
um, with regard to racial and cultural diversity, we have more intermixing between those groups that are producing um, more variations within our human um, human look. So yes, we have um, these, you know, people try to predict how people will look, um, but it really depends on who's mixing, right? And, and how often they mix. So let's talk real quick about um, these ideas of collecting specimens. So we have um, scalping, which um, is very kind of prevalent in American um, in our American ideas of you know what the colonies were like. Um, so when usually people think of scalping, they think of Native Americans going and taking the the, the heads the top pieces of, um, um, you know, their enemies, right? When actually um, in 400 BC, um, Scythians, like kind of in the Siberian area, this like kind of Euro-Asian um, portion of the, um, of that uh, Eurasian continent, they, there's evidence um, from scalping um, from the human skulls of people that has been reported um, through archaeological evidence. And it was seen um, or it was studied that, that this was done by using a, <laughs> an ox bone of um, dead enemies. Um, we also have um, records from 1641, the Dutch governor of Manhattan offering um, bounties, for, uh, like so offering European men um, to go collect the scalps uh, from Indian heads, right? Um, 1703, you have the Massa Massachusetts Bay Colony um, offering $60 per Indian scalp um, to bring back. So, um, you know, th these were highly sought after items. Um, in 1756, you have the Lieutenant Governor of Pennsylvania declaring war against the Lenny Lenny Lenape and encouraging people, European um, or people of European origin to go out and collect the scalps of the Lenny Lenape um, peoples. Um, and then um, you have this mythologizing in 1874 of this um, and heroizing of this uh, woman named Hannah Dustin, who in 1697 was captured by um, people say Abenaki people um, in like up in kind of the New England area. And um, the story goes that she was left by her captors with a family of four adults and six children. And then she escaped. Um, but before she escaped, she killed and scalped all 10 of those people, six of which were, which were children. So in 1874, there was a statue commemorating um, Miss Dustin for scalping the Abenaki people. And I just click and see if my, my uh, animation works, which I'm not sure it does. No, unfortunately it doesn't. So um, what ended up happening is um, the story about her leaving uh, or killing the six children is left out. They were just considered adults and, um, and you know, vicious Indians that had kidnapped her. But um, 1874, they put up the statue and the statue shows her holding in one hand a tomahawk and on the other hand, she has a lock um, of the 10 scalps. Um, recently, the, um, like, in 2020, the with the, the movements to decolonize and get rid of the um, um, you know colonizer um, and oppressor statues, that statue was actually defaced with red paint because it, it you know depicts it doesn't tell the full story and it depicts a very violent um, aspect of American history. Um, and then you have and popular culture. Um, uh, scalping was also seen to be a, a, a warning. So actually French and British, it was, um, uh, it has been proposed that the French and British actually introduced this practice 
to Native American groups so that and paid them off to collect the scalps of their enemies. Um, but Natives also used it as a warning sign. So this image on the bottom left hand corner shows a person that actually survived scalping because you didn't necessarily, you know, that would be a great way to kind of uh, kind of walking billboard to like, hey, stay out of our territory. Oh, here we go. There's the image of the woman holding the scalps. And then there's the defacement. And then we see um, the survivor uh, from the scalping also in The Revenant, um, that movie. All right, so specimen collecting was also a thing in New Zealand with Ta Moko and Moko Makai. So Ta Moko are the facial tattoos, which you see on the bottom um, images. The bottom left image, image is from the 1800s. The bottom right image is from um, like the 2000s. And so these uh, facial tattoos um, just kind of depict a person's lineage within Maori culture, right? So just by looking at a person, you could see maybe who they were related to, what area they came from, and so on and so forth, right? Um, you could also see the gender um, very easily. Um, so now when um, various Maori groups, because when we talk about Maori, um, the idea is like that they're all one group of people. When prior to British colonization of the area, there were multiple groups of people, right? Multiple different clans, multiple different tribes, if you will. Multi multiple different communities. So not everybody like lived and got along with each other. Um, just like in um, uh, Turtle Island, right? Um, North America, you had different nations. Um, you had like 500 something um, different groups of indigenous people and indigenous communities that didn't necessarily all agree on everything. Um, you had the same thing going on in New Zealand. And so um, when people went to war, um, the different groups of Maori, they would cut off the heads and take them as trophies, right? Um, now when British came over, they were already used to collecting scalps and other different um, things, right? Um, collecting different live specimens of plants and animals and sending them back home. Um, when the British people discovered this, they were like, oh my God, that's so cool. Let's get them. And so um, they would trade um, guns and weapons to the local Maori groups in exchange for these heads. So now when um, the people, the Maori groups discovered that like, oh, we got this great weaponry now, we can go defeat our enemies. What they would do is um, they wanted more guns, and so maybe there weren't um, enough heads to go around. They started this war called the Musket Wars, and what ended up happening is they started chopping off people's heads. People were just chopping off heads kind of left and right, um, and so what this did was even if they didn't have tattoos on their face, they would post humusly, I have a trouble saying that word, but they would, um, after death, they would tattoo the faces so that they could take the um, skulls or the faces, or the, the heads, the mokamokai, which is what they're called, take them, trade them with the Europeans, get the guns, and then they could go defeat and get the resources you know, that they wanted, land, um, access to food and whatnot. Um, and so, what ended up happening with Moko Makai, and you can see um, up on the top left, or top top left, um, is a collection um, in France at one of the museums of a lot of the heads, the tattooed heads that were collected as kind of specimens and curios. Um, and then there's a close up on the upper right hand corner. Um, and so these were held in various museums. I'm sure there's tons out there still in various institutions and in private homes. Um, you know, there's like decolonization has been occurring for a long time, since at least the 1960s, right? Um, and, you know, even you can say uh, when colonization started, there were people rebelling against it and trying to decolonize. But um, in the early 2000, um, 2000s, um, 
uh, New Zealanders, native uh, Maori people, they uh, wanted to get their, um, you know, remnants of their descendant or their um, ancestors back. And so they petitioned the government and they fought for a long time. And finally, in 2002, France re um, repatriated a bunch of the Moko Makai back to New Zealand. And so we'll see how this worked um, with regard to Hottentot Venus. And you guys, live specimen and desire. So in 1652, we know that the Dutch uh, colonized South Africa. And then soon after, in the 1820s, the British settlers arrived and began their um, colonization of the um, territory which would become South Africa. Um, in the late 1700s, um, Sarah Bartman, um, who was a Khoisan woman, was born in the Cape Colony um, in South Africa. So um, at, when she was young um, and of an age where she could work, she began uh, working as a domestic servant um, to some Dutch descended people. Um, in 1810, she signed a contract to travel to Europe um, and perform. Um, what she thought she would be doing was going on a trip to Europe, uh, a fanciful land of um, imagination, um, and she had the desire to, you know, become famous. Um, and so she thought she would be singing and dancing. Um, however, what ended up happening is the person under whose, um, I guess, uh, management she was under, um, who she had happened to be the domestic servant of that man. Um, he actually took her to a Piccadilly Circus in London and put her on display um, because of her body type. And you see in the upper left-hand corner, um, there is a wax cast actually of her um, her body because um, when she passed away um, in France where she had been working not only um, being put on display and uh, performing in like the kind of freak shows um, as like this savage beast um, she ended up um, also prostituting herself um, and doing sexual um, acts for money um, at that time, um, prostitutes were regulated, and so their um, health was um, was checked, and it turned out that she had um, a disease. Um, and with that disease, instead of her uh, going to the hospital or you know um, the, her madams taking care of her, um, they just kind of kicked her out. And so, unfortunately, she died uh, a lonely. Um, kind of very depressed and sad woman. And uh, what ended up happening is um, her former handlers were notified and the medical officers came, collected her body. They removed her, um, her reproductive or organs as well as her genitals. Um, they put them in formaldehyde and they used them to teach um, in gynecological um, schools about, you know, the human um, physique and uh, female um, evolution, not only female evolution, but human evolution, as well as um, female medicine, and looking at different anomalies, if you will. Um, so because of her body, not only was she um, put on display, but she made a lot of money off of it. There is a wonderful film, uh, Venus Noir, which is in French. Um, it is available to view, um, and it shows the very disturbing um, life of um, Sarah Bartman, which is her name. And it's really hard to watch. But then again, um, when you think about you know the the oppression and the um, lack of humanization of um, people that look different, 
um, I think it's an important film to watch because it is so uncomfortable and because we really see um, the extent of the dehumanization that people that did not fit the mold um, of the norms, um, how they were treated. They were treated with disrespect. They were treated as animals. Again, they dehumanized, right? Um, they were uh, exoticized and um, unfortunately, oftentimes uh, people like that, they suffered um, even up and beyond their death, right? So um, her body and her parts were kept um, in France um, up in, and they were on display in France at the museum um, up until 1974. And um, it was only after apartheid ended in South Africa in 1994 and um, President Nelson Mandela, the first uh, fully democratically elected um, president who was of, um, who it was a, uh, a Xhosa man, um, he was elected president. And in 2002, um, South Africa requested um, Sarah Bartman's remains to be repatriated back to South Africa and uh, they were finally repatriated. Um, so it's not unsimilar to um, the repatriation of the Mokomakai um, and uh, various artworks and other, um, other items, um, funerary, funerary items um, and human remains that are in institutions of uh, higher education and uh, institutions like the London Museum of Art, uh, Metropolitan Museum of Art. Um, many of those items were stolen from, um, you know, very sacred places. And, um, but because they are considered beautiful and because they are considered exotic and because they are used for education purposes, um, they are still held. Um, so how do we, how do we rectify those things? So one of the interesting uh, things about Sarah Bartman's presence in Europe was, um, you know, she, so she, because she was a voluptuous woman um, and she had a, a large um, gluteus maximus, um, that actually spurred a movement in fashion to imitate her. Um, her body because it was seen as so exotic and it was seen as being animalistic and a kind of uh, a, a view and a showing of fertility. And so the bustles of Victorian age, um, women having the large um, like um, the frames for creating a larger um, backside um, was actually appropriated and imitated by the fashion industry at that time. And um, to the left, you have an example of one of the fashion drawings. And then um, the center image is actually um, a, a photograph um, from the Victorian age that shows a dress made in that style. Again, looking at photography and um, thinking about how people that were visiting these colonies um, were collecting specimen. So not only were they collecting parts of people, so their scalps, um, their heads. Um, there was for a time Europeans were going over to Egypt and um, there was a, a frenzy of purchasing um, mummies, Egyptian mummies, and kind of having them at the corner of the house as, you know, like a curio thing, something to be talked about. But photography was also big um, at exploring, right, and showing the difference um, and the wonder of the world, right? And so remember, um, in the mid 1800s, this is when photography first became um, a thing. And so, um, the photographers would stage um, these photographs to show how exotic and different um, people were in these far off places. And so um, for studying human diversity, photography was used um, as a kind of easy way to uh, collect specimens. 
So with photography, with film, um, and uh, we already talked about the creative industries and the male gaze, how men were predominantly in those positions of um, creating the images for mass consumption and the public. Um, when we look at our advertisements um, over the um, up until um, the maybe let's say the early 2000s, um, there has been a lot of um, advertisements that have used women as props, right? Women as objects. Um, if we look at the Dulce and Gabbana 2007 um, advertisement, you see a woman lying on her back um, and in a, a you know dark swimsuit. And um, there is a man kind of standing over her, um, kind of holding her, not kind of, but actually holding her one arm down. Um, and there's another man looking over her. Um, so not only do we see these examples of um, maleness being um, kind of dominant and veering over a submissive woman, but we also see um, like, um, an ideal body image, not only of the men who are bare chested, they're um, kind of sculpted, um, light skinned, you know, um, and in positions of power, but we see, you know, the svelte woman who is submissive, right? These are the ideals. Um, so for a long time, um, fashion advertisements and fashion magazines have promoted gender stereotypes. Um, and it's because of this male gaze, right? Um, and these male gazes um, ultimately have objectified women. And so um, one of the things that um, advertisements have started to do, especially during the Me Too movement, is unpack gender and unpack the toxic masculinity of, let's say, examples of this um, Dolce & Gabbana advertisement. And if you were actually to um, um, uncrop the image, um, you would see that um, to the left, there are two more men that are looking over and they're looking very, um, you know, wantingly and um, kind of predatorial at the woman who's um, like being pinned down on the floor, which um, is very much kind of reminiscent of like either a gangbang or a gang rape. Um, and so very aggressive, very violent, right? really stereotyping this toxic masculinity. And so in um, we have this um, term called femvertising, um, tries to unpack the tox toxic masculinity and maybe sometimes flip the, um, the narrative, right? Um, so instead of having women be objectified, you have these um, advertising um, campaigns that actually came out, I think, last year. Um, so they're the um, two down at the bottom. They're advertising female uh, women's suits um, and, you know, very svelte um, women. So they're still advertising this um, and promoting this ideal body type of a slim figured woman um, and kind of very sharp angles, symmetrical. It doesn't matter if they're dark skin or light skin. Um, you know, there's a body type. Um, what's a little bit different about these advertisements is that um, they are objectifying men. So um, how, when we are looking at this and we're looking at these ideas of beauty and these ideals of beauty um, and looking at gender or race, um, are they really challenging or are they taking um, you know, the, the tools of the oppressor and just using them and twisting them so that they can oppress other people. Um, this is something that's really important to think about when you are, you know, um, watching movies, when you're looking through magazines, because everything, especially in advertisement and, and film, everything is a, a conscious decision. Nothing is just kind of put there randomly, right? Um, People are trying to get you to buy certain things and buy certain um, ideals so that you can um, consume that those things, right? And advertisers get a lot of money to um, create these images. So just think about that while you're um, in the world out consuming um, advertisements and um, media. Gender in the male gaze, um, Laura Mulvey. 1975 uh, wrote the article Visual Pleasure and Narrative Cinema. So in it, um, she discussed how women are typically the objects 
um, rather than the possessors of the gaze, right? Because men are the ones that are the creative geniuses, if you will, and they are behind the camera. Um, up until, you know, fairly recently, that has been the norm. Um, and because the majority of those men happen to be heterosexual and they are um, producing things for a heterosexual gaze, um, women tend to be objectified, right? Um, and the, um, the assumption of the heterosexual man as the default target audience for most film genres has um, dominated um, in um, Mulvey's argument has dominated um, film industry um, up until very recently. Um, and if you look at a lot of the, um, the film that is coming out today, you still um, find this. So again, uh, with the male gaze, um, Mulvey argues that the hypersexualization of the other um, is portrayed and promoted throughout this industry. Um, and the other being women, right? Because again, because men were the creative, um, the creative forces behind the camera or, you know, behind the, the brush, um, they were the ones producing. And so the vision is very androcentric and the other becomes the other gender, right? Um, and in this case, the women. And we can see this um, again, back to Marilyn Monroe, but um, this is a perfect example of her being draped over the piano, right? We see her um, chest kind of, you know, not fully bare, but um, bare. Um, we see her long legs. And if you think back to any of the films that you've seen, um, how many films have you seen with full frontal nudity of women versus how many full frontal nudity um, male um, images have you seen? Um, and the question that I have down at the bottom is, how do women buy into um, the this idea of the male gaze and also how do they challenge the male gaze? Is it challenged at all? So coming into misappropriation, so the fashion industry, the photography industry has done a lot to um, create certain images and to get people to buy into these images. Um, uh, not only um, the images, but also the, the material pieces of the culture. Um, high fashion sells, you know, items for, you know, a lot of money. Um, and the models that um, get to um, where the items are highly specialized, right? And they're highly regulated. So um, in the fashion industry, there seems to be this trend um, to misappropriate um, various um, significant cultural items from other cultures, right? Without um, knowing the stories behind them. So this um, Victoria's Secret um, model runway or runway model up on the upper left corner of the screen shows a woman with um, a um, full um, war bonnet on that is um, typically worn by um, male leaders of uh, Plains Indians communities. Um, and each feather is supposed to represent either a war that was started or, or finished, um, or a war that was, um, or sorry, a piece that was made, right? And so these are um, not only um, symbols of diplomacy, but also symbols of um, a person's bravery, um, a leader specifically is bravery, and men wear them, women do not. And so to have a Victoria's Secret model, who is just like pretty much a pretty face um, and a walking um, a, a walking uh, hanger, if you will, for clothes, a, a display, um, it's it's very inappropriate and disrespectful misappropriation of a highly um, significant cultural item for that group of people. Um, and then you have, again, um, she, to back to the Victoria's Secret model, she is also wearing silver um, bangles and a belt and um, a necklace, which also has turquoise in it. And again, kind of misappropriating. Um, yes, non-Native people do wear those things, but um, 
you know, wear these um, these items. However, to wear them in such a, uh, a kind of display of the human form goes against the um, actual um, Navajo people who produce these items, um, who, you know, wear these items ceremonially, ceremonially um, and um, are also very concerned in their, um, their attire, right? And you can see the juxtaposition of the Victoria's Secret model up at the top, and then down at the bottom you have the, um, the a, a group of um, young Navajo women who, again, um, they are wearing more, um, clothing that cover them. Um, they're more modest. Um, they have their uh, turquoise jewelry. Um, also, interestingly enough, um, they are um, a larger bodied, right, than the um, this ideal um, fashion model of um, of Victoria's Secret, right? And so, with regard to um, how we, as Western cultures, um, look at the other and take those items and then um, use them um, in, in commodification of clothing, of um, perceptions of beauty. Um, it's very important to kind of unpack these, these ideals and um, to n not um, dehumanize people so that they only become like feathers or silver or turquoise, right? Um, those items actually represent human beings, right? Um, and so we want to rehumanize. Um, and then finally, the last example is um, Kim Kardashian, who, um, you know, she broke the internet with that picture of her um, big bum. Um, and that uh, harkens back to, again, this idea of hot and tot Venus. Um, uh, appropriating her body type and sexualizing it, hypersexuality, right, um, of Kim Kardashian and um, also of um, Sarah Bartman, right, who really didn't want to be sexualized. Uh, she just wanted to, you know, like have an adventure, right? Um, and so to kind of take that and play off of that, um, not only as Kim Kardashian, but as the photographer, um, it really disrespects um, and it also um, negates the pain and suffering um, that actually went on um, with regard to that particular story. So talking about um, contemporary beauty standards of the fashion industry. So 1960s, you have Twiggy um, and her images is on the um, upper left hand corner of the screen in the black and white. And she basically um, typified the or exemplified um, what was beautiful at the time. And that became the standard. So much like poly polycolitis, um, how his images and sculptures of the athletes became the standard of the Roman Greco time. Um, Twiggy became the standard of the 1960 um, kind of postmodern time, if you will. Um, and so from then, um, as mentioned in the Minter article, um, Naomi Campbell and um, uh, Kate Moss, they also typified and um, carried on these um, ideals of the very slender, slim um, fashion model that would, um, you know, be able to um, go on the runway and basically wear anything and still, like, there wouldn't be any gaps or, or you know, glitches in the clothing because um, just like a hanger, a, a cloth clothes look good, the less um, bulk you have, um, the better the clothing will drape, right? That's the theory of fashion models. Um, and then if we continue to look at um, the beauty standards um, within um, like musicians, they are not uh, immune to these things. So you have Beyonce, um, who, uh, you know, she's fairly light skin, but she, again, she has these very symmetrical features. She's fairly slim. 
Um, she has long hair. So these ideals are continue, continually um, upgraded and um, re-manifested throughout various industries of public media, right? Rihanna is another example. Um, so even though uh, like they're not white and so they seem diverse, um, really are they promoting diversity um, if they're just kind of typifying the, that same body standard? And then um, looking down at the bottom row, you have Victoria Modesta, who um, actually has, uh, she's missing one leg and she's, you know, very beautiful. So in a way she typifies that beauty standard, that contemporary beauty standard that is, uh, you know, slim, svelte, um, long-legged. She was a dancer before she lost her leg um, at a fairly early age, um, but um, that didn't stop her from continuing um, her public um, and, and pursuing a public life. Um, but she put a little twist on it because she um, does not have a leg. She um, played with these ideas of beauty and desire, right? And so because she only has one, you know, natural leg and she um, wears a prosthesis, um, she still wanted to um, be desirable. And so she definitely plays on the male gaze, but she's very much more um, um, uh, confrontational with it. And in so doing, she, cre you know, she is the other because um, most people, you know, like have both limbs and that's what's promoted in, in society, you know, like having full, being fully able-bodied, right? Um, but she um, takes her prosthesis and she puts this like, element of desire in it so that it um, like takes people out of their comfort zone and makes them question these ideas of desire, right? Um, and then the next image that is just kind of moving through various images shows, um, you know, these, how these beauty standards um, of the contemporary 1960s, the postmodern era, if you will, are being challenged by people with um, varying um, abilities, right? Um, you have amputees, um, you have people, uh, paraplegics, right? Um, people with um, uh, quadriplegia um, and, and various other um, ab abilities. Um, and then coming to um, plus size models, if you will, um, larger bodied models. These are um, movements that are, um, you know, have been ongoing for a long time. And yes, there are some companies that um, do um, kind of speak to larger bodied um, people, people um, that are more average, if you will, um, with regard to the body standard um, or the body norms of, you know, rather than the ideals. Um, and then let's see some others. So athletes, um, again, this is a, um, I believe he might be a linebacker. Um, he was photographed um, for Sports Illustrated, a nude of him or several nudes of him. So these are three examples. Um, if you, you know, a lot of people, when they see a, a body like this, they do not necessarily think, um, oh, athlete, right? They might have all these other stereotypes about this person. Um, but he is a football player and, you know, some of these football players are quite large. Um, and so what this photographer and nicely what Sports Illustrated was doing was challenging the, those stereotypes, right, of the ideal body. Because what is the ideal athlete? Um, it, it really varies depending on sports, depending on position. Um, and I mean, there is no, there is no normal, right? Um, and then here's another um, example. Um, this is a golfer. He's an older gentleman. So typically we don't necessarily see um, older people um, as being portrayed as beautiful, right? Um, and then um, these are women that survived uh, breast cancer. Um, I think, uh, yeah, double 
mastectomy, um, single mastectomy. And so these women are taking and challenging those ideals of beauty standards, right? So not only do we um, challenge the idea, um, or do they, these women, they challenge these idea of what does it mean to be a woman? Does it mean having breasts? Does it mean being slim? Does it mean having all of your limbs? Does it mean um, being um, super muscular, right? The a lot of these things that we um, uh, don't necessarily get exposed to in the popular media are things that we really should um, examine because in our everyday lives, um, it's so much more diverse than um, what we actually give um, value to. So to conclude, the colonial project has a long lasting effect and implications on today. Um, how we portray people, um, you know, we talked about this idea of the male gaze, who is behind the camera, who is the one that are sending those specimens back home, what are we collecting? Um, and these perceptions of the other affect who we consider to be human, um, who we consider worthy of protection, who we consider um, um, who we consider, right? Um, the, the visibility of people as well as the invisibility of people because um, the other can be hyper visible. They can also be hyper invisible, right? Um, so this idea of um, beauty having power um, is really important because it shows the values of the culture because beauty is not universal. It is very subjective and it is in the eye of the beholder. And um, when we um, actually look at the history of it, when we look at the implications of who has the power to tell the story about beauty, um, then we can think about, you know, like rehumanizing people and seeing the beauty in everything and everybody, um, every body, right? Um, and we can challenge and push back of what um, people can consider beautiful and expand that notion. So why in such a big, you know, 7 billion people do we have to all prescribe to one ideal? Um, why can't there be multiple ideals? Because in so doing, we can find, um, you know, beauty in everything. So um, I hope this was enlightening and um, this got you to think a little bit differently about um, the media and um, advertisements and art because everything has a reason um, and the way we see um, these other people and the things that are reflected um, in media actually have large implications on how we see ourselves and where we place ourselves um, on the spectrum of you know like are we human? Are we worthy? Um, and, um, you know, are we worthy of, of having our stories told? Are we worthy of being seen? And yes, we all are, all are worthy.